The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian from Horizon, and I hope everyone's doing well this evening. I see a number of people are still trickling in for tonight's webinar, which has been a very hot topic. So we're going to give it a minute or so before we actually get started. But I hope everyone has been having a fantastic summer. And I'm very excited to go over some very critical items with water woes. Now, myself, I actually won't be doing the presentation. We have a very special guest tonight. Mr. Alan Carson will be doing the presentation and giving you his insights into building science in the building envelope. Now, just to let everyone know, this is quite a lengthy topic, so we're actually going to be splitting this up into two parts. We're going to cover approximately 60 minutes this evening, have a Q&A period at the end, and then we're going to set up a subsequent session for everyone to attend where we're going to be able to cap off with a part two. So this is going to be a two-part series on the building science and envelope. And tonight we're going to look at some water woes, as water is the number one enemy of the home. So uh, I see that we're still getting a few people trickling in, but because we do have so much content to cover, I am going to turn it over to Mr. Carson at this point in time to get us started. And so without further ado, I'm just going to pass over the presentation. And Perfect. There we go. So, Brian, you can hear me all right? Brian, you can hear me all right? Not sure if you're talking yet there, Alan, because I'm not able to hear you. I don't think the audience is either. Um, yeah, I'm speaking, and it's showing that it's working here uh, on air showing screen. Perfect. No, everything's good. You just want to, you're, you're good to go. All right. Good stuff. All right. Well, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight on a beautiful uh, summer day. So I appreciate you taking the, the time to uh, sit in front of a computer. Um, as Brian said, this is a, a session that has two parts to it. So we're going to talk about kind of rain in this session and then the more insidious condensation and uh, moisture traveling through vapor and air and so on in the second part, which uh, we'll pick up on at some point. So as always, I've got too much to say and too little time, so I'm going to jump right in and uh, get started. And uh, I think uh, the plan is uh, at the end, uh, I think you can uh, address your questions. Uh, Brian will feed them back to me. and. Uh, We'll deal with some Q&A. I think we'll, we're scheduled for an hour, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see. I'll probably chat for an hour and then maybe take some questions. Uh, so uh, again, appreciate your attendance and uh, hang around for as long as you can. And uh, let's go. Uh, before we get started, Alan, just had another person mention some audio issues. Just want to confirm, would anyone be so kind as to let me know if they're able to hear Alan at this time? In the chat, if you could just let me know if you're able to hear. Perfect. I really do appreciate that. I will uh, speak to the individual directly. Please, Alan, if you continue, I'll, I'll, I'll work on that to, in the background. All right. Good stuff. Thanks, Brian. All right. Well, to those uh, who can hear me, uh, here we go. Um, so I talked about this, the, the marketing guys gave this a sexier title, but uh, I call this presentation Building Science in the Building Envelope, and uh, it's always good to define what you're talking about, and uh, building science uh, is defined as the use of scientific principles to analyze the behavior of buildings, and uh, so building science shortens nicely to BS, which uh, I'm hoping you're not going to get too much of tonight. Um, the goal is to help get you folks comfortable with uh, building science and to help you identify more issues more often. And we're going to focus on some of the things that are not immediately apparent uh, when you're doing an inspection. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the nuts and bolts, and then we'll spend uh, the last half looking at some uh, photos and uh, getting uh, some clues as to what things we might watch for. So as Brian said at the outset, water definitely uh, the number one enemy of houses. Um, 
interesting talking to uh, my colleagues on the insurance side and uh, when people buy home and auto insurance uh, people think about uh, fire and so on but uh, more than half of all homeowner insurance claims are related to water so uh, it's definitely an issue where does water get into the house uh, all kinds of places roof walls foundations today we're going to focus primarily on the walls the building science side of things and although we'll touch on a number of systems i'm going to focus on wood frame a because it's uh, particularly common and also because it is singularly vulnerable to uh, to water damage so wood frame walls clad with all kinds of different things whether it be vinyl masonry stucco whatever uh, will be a, a bit of a focus for us today so water is definitely a problem and it's not always this easy to find although this is a pretty horrific photograph uh, gives you a sense of uh, the damage that flooding can do I'm not sure that these houses are, are salvageable at this point um, it's the the hidden subtle stuff that is quite frankly the the bigger problem for home inspectors and uh, the source of some liability as well when we don't pick up things where there were clues so uh, we'll look a little bit at that um, interestingly when water damage is apparent and uh, everybody sees it people address it they get the issue fixed they solve the problem and, and fix the damage it's that hidden stuff that's going on inside the walls that you don't see right away that can cause really dramatic damage can uh, get us into the world of rot and mold and uh, so it's that insidious water damage that uh, is quite frankly way more problematic than a roof leak that uh, comes down onto somebody's bed and nobody's going to tolerate that for very long they're going to address that right away uh, damage to walls a little tougher to pick up and uh, can do a lot of hidden damage before it does get detected so where does the water come from um, rain condensation of course plumbing and heating leaks uh, hot water systems uh, surface water runoff groundwater um, overland water as the uh, insurance folks like to talk about it um, we've had some pretty significant floods in Canada over the last uh, five to eight years uh, certainly Calgary and Toronto uh, have had some pretty uh, pretty significant flood issues and insurance companies have gotten very protective and restrictive about uh, flood damage and so on what's covered uh, homeowners uh, need to pay a lot more attention than they used to to uh, sewer backup and and flood issues on insurance I don't want to digress too far on that but uh, it's uh, an interesting thing for homeowners to pay attention to more so than ever and uh, as I said at the outset we're going to focus on rain uh, today and uh, in a later session we'll talk a little bit about condensation but uh, we're going to ignore some of the other stuff and focus on uh, the rain um, in part because it does more damage to walls than anything else it uh, it's a pretty significant issue so I've broken the session down into four parts we're going to start by looking at how rain gets into the walls then we'll talk about how we try to keep it out and then what we do when we fail to keep it out how do we get rid of it and then uh, close off with some things to look for and uh, hopefully pick up uh, small issues before they become big ones um, rain is hard on walls and I've said here that a wall sure isn't a roof and it's interesting that when we put a roof on a home we understand it's going to get the brunt of rain and snow and whatever comes down from the skies people building walls don't pay as much attention and it's not as intuitively obvious that the walls are going to be under heavy attack from water as well so there tends to be less attention paid and very often we end up paying a pretty significant price for that so let's have a look at what uh, gets water into walls and we need a driving force so if the water comes straight down uh, on a dead calm day the odds are it's not going to get the walls too terribly wet however once the wall gets wet because of wind pushing the rain into it gravity becomes a factor as the water makes its way down the wall pulled by gravity and capillary action um, that suction effect uh, as a result of surface tension that pulls water into the gaps in walls uh, is a contributor 
And in some cases, vapor diffusion can be a problem, although generally that's uh, a much smaller issue. So we won't focus on that. I just wanted to mention it uh, in the interest of being inclusive. So I think everybody intuitively knows that nature's pretty lazy. Everything moves from an area of high energy to low. Water flows, heat flows, air flows, and uh, vapor pressure flows. So everything wants to move from up to down, high to low, um, crowded to uh, vacant, whichever way you think of it. And that's kind of helpful to keep in mind. So when we think about walls versus roofs, we really need three things to cause a problem in the wall. So we need some kind of opening or porous path in the walls. And if we built walls without doors or windows or joints or railings, life would be a lot simpler. But the reality is we keep poking holes in walls. So pretty reasonable to anticipate we're going to have some uh, imperfect uh, joints along the way. Uh, where does the water come from? We've talked about a few sources, but we're going to focus uh, for our purposes today on rain. Condensation comes a little bit later. And to some extent, and in a poorly managed building, the water that lands on the roof can become an issue for walls. So. Uh, eaves troughs are gutters that catch the rain, but a downspout that's missing can have an elbow at the bottom of a gutter directing rain right against the wall off the roof. So that can cause a, a pretty localized problem, but that's usually pretty visually apparent pretty quickly. Um, and then we need something that drives the water from the outside into the wall system. So it can be wind, it can be gravity as we touched on, we can, it can be capillary action. So all three of those things need to take place for us to have a problem in our walls. And sadly, all three of them do take place pretty regularly. So when we talk about uh, openings, porous paths, uh, we touched on windows, doors, flashings, penetrations, um, lights, doorbells, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and some walls are inherently porous. Um, masonry walls, for example, are uh, porous, so water can get straight through the cladding material, depending on uh, what we're dealing with. Um, you have to assume that if the wall gets wet, since every joint can't be perfect, we're going to end up with water inside the wall. So the, the starting premise has to be that all walls will leak. Now this one leaked in a fairly dramatic fashion. This is vinyl siding, or let me rephrase that, this was vinyl siding until it got hit by um, hail in, this is 2008 uh, hailstorm in Texas. And as you can see, it just shredded the siding. One of the things that's interesting is you look at the side of the house where all that siding is gone, and yet look around the corner on the right side of the picture. The siding's slightly damaged, but in a whole lot better shape. And this is one of the factors that is so true. When we talk about rain, it's only a problem when it's wind-driven, but it's wind-driven a lot, and I'll show you a slide on that. And it's also true that in most areas in North America, most of the heavy wind-driven rain comes from the same direction. And uh, here in Toronto, most of our really heavy wind-driven rains come from the east. And I don't really understand the climatic forces that cause that to happen because our prevailing winds in Toronto are generally from the west or northwest, except when it's raining, and then the wind direction is predominantly from the east. So maybe there's a meteorologist who can explain to me why that is. But you need to know in your area where the heavy wind-driven rains come from so that you can be looking at those exposures of the buildings for the concealed water problems that we're going to be talking about. Okay, so rain and wind often act together and then compounded by the gaps in the building and aided and embedded by capillary action. So that's the formula for trouble. So this is a comment that I was alluded to earlier, and it's fascinating to me. So when it's not raining, 
it's windy about half the time. And again, I'm going to talk on average here in different climates and different areas are going to be different. Uh, people living uh, on the coast probably have a different uh, sense of, of that. But this is, uh, is kind of a general North America-wide average truism. And interestingly, when it's raining, it's windier. So winds are stronger and more frequent when it's raining. And that's the way weather works, and that's a problem for us. That's what uh, creates the, the driving force that gets the rain into the wall system. So what have we said so far? Nothing very earth-shattering. Rain matters, of course. Wind matters more than you might think. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but drying potential matters a lot. And drying potential is how quickly can the wall get rid of the moisture once it gets in. So we'll leave that for now and come back to it in a little bit. Um, I'm going to tell you that capillary action matters more than you might think, and uh, we'll look at some examples of that, but uh, it is a devilishly powerful little thing that has no sense of up, down, or sideways. Capillary action doesn't care about gravity. It kind of works in any direction. And uh, Capillary action is also called wicking, and it's a result of surface tension and materials that have pores uh, will draw moisture up. So here we stuck a stalk of celery into a glass filled with uh, water and food coloring. And the celery is not by nature red, but you can see that it has drawn the water up, defying gravity, and uh, the celery. Uh, has turned red from the food coloring that was below it. Paper towels are the same thing. If you take a tip of a paper towel and dump it onto water spilled on a counter, you'll notice the paper towel will get wet as the water climbs up the paper towel. So again, capillary action or wicking. So it's a real thing. It's real common. It's ubiquitous in nature. And sadly, it's ubiquitous in houses too. So it's definitely a contributor to the problems we're going to be talking about. And here's kind of my definition of a crack that uh, might suffer from capillary action. So when this wall gets wet, those little cracks are going to actually pull water in quite actively. And the general rule of thumb is if the crack is less than about 3 sixteenths of an inch, so if it's a quarter inch wide or 3 eighths or a half an inch wide, it's probably not going to suffer much from capillary action. You might get some driving rain in, which is a different issue, but the capillary action are those little cracks that tend to be less noticeable, but do cause pretty significant uh, water problems because of their sponge-like affinity to pull any water on the surface into the wall assembly. If you're old enough to remember old siding nails, and uh, I'm starting to feel like I might be the only one left, those of you who dealt with uh, clapboard and uh, siding and siding nails back in the day, you may remember that the heads used to be round, or more correctly, half round, so that when you drove the nail, it had a, a round head on it instead of the flat, more common nail surface. And why was that? That was because back in the day, they understood about capillary action. And the purpose of the round head on the nail was to hold the next board above away from the board that it was covering. So the idea was twofold, that if you had that gap, it would tend to break the capillary action and water running down would not stick to the siding, run along the bottom and up the back of it. And also, I mentioned drying potential a little bit earlier. Also, those round head nails kept the board separated so the breeze could blow through and it would help remove and dry any moisture that got in behind the wall. So it, it's something that we've kind of lost, uh, something that used to be a great idea, something that we used to do for a very good reason, and we've kind of gotten away from it to our, to our detriment. So um, is there something to be learned from the wisdom of the elders? Absolutely. Are we too smart to learn the lessons nowadays? So it seems. So surface tension makes water go bad places. Um, so you may be familiar with the term capillary break. 
And a capillary break has lots of different forms in architecture and building technology. Uh, a drip edge on a metal flashing. Metal flashings typically have the bottom edge canted out at about 45 degrees and often have a return on it, not only to hide the sharp edge of the metal to avoid people whacking themselves on it, but also to strengthen that lower edge and to have it form a drip that will break the capillary action. The other example you see all the time is on the underside of a windowsill, the underside of a chimney cap, that kind of thing. So it looks like this, and if you start looking at this illustration on the left side, so we've got a wood frame brick veneer wall, we're looking at a window here from the side, we've got a, uh, a concrete precast sill, and you can see the sill's got a slope on it to, to drain the water away. And if you look at the underside of the sill, you'll see there's a groove close to the outer edge, and that's your capillary break. So the theory is that when the water comes down, by the way, the wettest part of a wall is the part just below a window because the water hits the glass and can't get absorbed or do anything else except run straight down, hits the window sill, and if we're lucky, it runs off the window sill and drops off onto the ground. If we're not lucky, it wraps itself around the sill and finds its way into the wall. So the capillary break is trying to keep the water from sticking to the underside of the window sill and driving back into the wall. So you can look at the uh, picture on the top. Without the capillary break, the water gets drawn right in. And believe me, the connection between the mortar joint at the top of the brick and the underside of the uh, concrete sill is rarely going to be perfect. So if the water is allowed to go there, it's going to find its way through. If you look at the one in the bottom in the center, this is the poor man's capillary break. You can run a bead of caulking along the underside of the sill, and that will create very often enough of a surface differential to break the tension and have the water drip down instead of run back under. And then on the far right is the one that we saw in the first picture, which is the best practices capillary break, which is the groove cut along the underside of the sill. So what do we know? It's, we're not going to avoid it. The rainwater wants to get into the walls. The rain comes down. It's driven by wind and gravity and capillary action to find its way through the imperfect wall assembly. That's just the way it is. So what do we do about it? Well, let's have a look at how we try to keep it out. And I'm going to simplify things as I always do because my head can't deal with complicated stuff. But I'm going to say there are four basic wall types. And the building scientists will be cringing. Uh, if you're out there, I apologize. But uh, I'm going to simplify for the sake of me understanding and hopefully communicating something. Uh, so the four wall types are the face seal system, the dual barrier, the rain screen, and the vented rain screen. And these are listed in order from the worst to the best. So again, with apologies to the uh, scientists uh, in the audience, that is my simplification. So the face seal system, some people call it a perfect barrier, and they wink as they're saying it because there is no such thing. But a face seal system is intended to be a watertight skin. And frankly, when people think about buildings and they think about walls, they assume that they're a watertight skin, even though we've talked about how that's not really true. So a face seal system has no cavity, no secondary backup plane, no drainage opportunity, no weep holes. It's a plastic bag wrapped around a building. And what would be an example, uh, stucco and uh, EFS or EFS, everybody pronounces it differently. My apologies if my pronunciation doesn't work for you. Um, wood siding, glass, buildings, uh, those are all examples of face seal systems. So here's a face seal system. And my thought is this, face seal systems work perfectly, but only if they're perfect and they almost never are. So synthetic stucco or EFS, a uh, face seal system, um, we know, and I, th I think the further towards the coast you get in Canada, the more you know about uh, how imperfect uh, stucco is and the, 
the leaky condo syndrome in uh, in British Columbia and so on. There's no shortage of documented failures of this system designed to be the perfect tight skin that keeps water out, but it never lives up to its billing. Never perfect. Here's a face seal system. This one uh, obviously in a commercial building, but the only thing keeping the water out is a single plane of glass. So the face sealed stucco failures, North Carolina, British Columbia, hard to get uh, appropriate insurance uh, for leaky condo stuff. And uh, the, the damage to buildings has just uh, been horrific over the years. Um, Parenthetically, and it really doesn't matter so much to home inspectors because you rarely get to see what the sheathing is made of, but it's perhaps useful to understand that oriented strand board or OSB is a whole lot worse than plywood when it comes to when the stucco fails, which it will, what happens next? And there's a couple of things that get in the way. So plywood is relatively permeable, OSB not so much. So plywood dries better after it gets wet and OSB rots better because it hangs on to the moisture. So it's, it's kind of like the sponge that won't give back. So the OSB uh, tends to be a more problematic uh, sheathing material. There's a pretty good example there. The siding's been removed, stucco's gone, and uh, you can see the shape of that OSB. So we got some pretty significant damage to that wall. Now, if you move on to the dual barrier system, it's the same thing as face seal with one addition. There is a secondary barrier behind it. So building paper, uh, I was going to say most of us grew up with, but I can't say that anymore. My generation grew up with building paper, and then house wrap became the miracle uh, solution. Uh, generically codes call them water resistive barriers and so they're the kind of belt and suspenders when we understand that the siding system is going to be imperfect we put something as simple as building paper overlapped going up the wall to help keep the moisture out in the fancier stuff you're going to see self-sealing or liquid waterproof membranes that's more commercial and the reality is, when I say you're going to see, I'm telling you a lie because you're really not going to see this very often unless the wall's in some kind of distress and coming apart. So knowing that that's there is often a trick unto itself. So the secondary barrier has a few jobs, stop the rain getting into the wall after it leaks past the siding. It also helps stop the wind from getting into the wall which is a bit of a less important thing, but it still helps to some extent by slowing down or stopping that driving force that pushes the water into the wall. Um, to some extent, it controls air leakage out of the home, but I'm going to say that's uh, reasonably insignificant. And acting as a vapor retarder uh, or vapor diffusion retarder or vapor barrier, I'm going to say that's not a big enough thing for us to worry about. And the frustrating thing, from a home inspection perspective is we don't know if there's one there, we don't know what it's made of, and we don't know if it's working properly or not. So there's a lot we can't see. And uh, I think uh, the smartest home inspectors are the newest ones who are not real sure of themselves, and the really seasoned ones who are smart enough to know that they shouldn't be too sure of themselves. I think there's a, a danger level in the middle where people think they've seen it all and get comfortable sometimes uh, at their own peril. Uh, there's a lot of people, uh, I don't know if any of you know uh, a crazy Canadian guy named Joe Steebrook uh, from Building Science Corporation. I think he's uh, he spent a lot of time in Toronto, uh, hung around with the folks at U of T, some of the great building scientists uh, from the, the 60s, 70s and 80s here. Um, and then he started his own company. I think he lives in Boston now. If you go to Building Science Corporation's website, he has tons of fascinating articles on there. He's the building scientist that is uh, irreverent. Uh, he's pretty salty, uh, very clever. 
Um, somewhat controversial. I don't agree with everything he says, but it's uh, if you want to get pushed on building science, it's it's a good website to go to. And uh, if you get a chance to hear Joe Stebrook uh, speak, it is uh, always entertaining. So. Um, Part of Joe's research was on the old tar paper versus the house wraps that are more modern. And the conclusion is that tar paper was, in a lot of ways, way better. Uh, it was more waterproof. The stucco didn't tend to stick to it. And when the stucco sticks to the house wraps, it doesn't go well. Uh, the tar paper actually absorbs and releases water better. House wrap doesn't do that so much. It doesn't stop water, and it certainly doesn't store water. And this whole drying potential thing depends to a large extent on how much the building materials can handle the failure, the water getting past the siding, and then can we absorb it, hold it, and then dry out quickly enough to avoid rot. Um, there is a school of thought, and there are some uh, areas in North America where you're required to use two layers of building paper. So a dual barrier plus an extra one. And there are some benefits to that. It creates an extra drainage plane. It obviously creates another line of defense. Uh, it provides a bond break so that materials, if they stick to one, uh, so if mortar, masonry, stucco stick to one sheet of building paper, the one behind it is still free to slip and move. Uh, buildings expand and contract and, and certainly wood frame ones fairly dramatically. It's one of the problems with stucco over wood frame buildings is the coefficient of thermal expansion, let me try that again, the coefficient of thermal expansion is different between the materials. So wood shrinks and expands at a different rate than does stucco cement based products. And so the wood wants to move the stucco not so much, and yet the stucco is being supported by the wood, and that's what causes a lot of cracking in, uh, in stucco buildings. And some of the thin stone veneers you're seeing today, um, the manufactured stone veneers are really just glorified stucco in my mind, um, although they would not appreciate me saying that probably. Um, so the two layers of building paper is kind of cool. Um, this is largely irrelevant because you're not going to see it, but I think it's kind of interesting. So we used to talk about 15-pound felts. And by the way, those of you who used to do roofing or are familiar with roofing, 15-pound felts were often used under asphalt shingles, clay tiles, slate, a lot of roofing material. So temporary barrier. These were saturated felts, and they were called 15-pound felts because the square of roofing, when you laid it down, if you took all the felts up, it would weigh 15 pounds. So Asphalt impregnated cellulose fiber. Um, they're no longer called 15 pound felts because like everything else in the world, money becomes the driver and so they got thinner and cheaper. So they're now called number 15 felts, which is to say they're thinner, lighter and not as good, but they're cheaper to make. So everybody's happy until they don't perform. Um, in some areas of North America, we've gone to straight building paper. And if you think of that as just craft paper with a light asphalt coating on it, not nearly as good, doesn't have the ability to hold and absorb moisture and then release it back to the outdoors as it dries, uh, much more inclined to rot when it gets wet. So it's a reality that we're uh, experiencing. It's not something that as home inspectors, we get to see or know very much about because it's buried in the wall. But those are some of the contributing factors to why things are going wrong. Um, house wrap, which was the, the magical stuff when it came out, took a while to show its uh, warts. And some of the warts are that it can absolutely deteriorate and disintegrate when it comes in contact with uh, what are called surfactants. And those are chemicals that reduce the surface tension and allow water to go right through the house wrap. When house wrap is new and you pour water on it, it'll repel it beautifully. If it's exposed directly to the wood tannins, stuff, uh, cedar siding, uh, the soaps in stucco, it will lose its ability to repel water. And now its behavior is pretty awful. And sometimes the house wrap itself simply falls apart and deteriorates. So 
not necessarily the greatest answer in the world, but I, I think we're all pretty familiar with seeing uh, housing subdivisions, new houses going up where the uh, house wrap uh, is there in all its glory with advertising larger than life and uh, people feel good about it. Yeah, this house is going to be well protected. Don't take that one to the bank. Not necessarily true. Um, people say, what about the permeability of the second barrier? Generally speaking, as I said a little while ago, vapor pressure is not the big issue. That doesn't cause a lot of rot and damage to buildings. There are always exceptions where you can call me a liar, but generally speaking, that vapor diffusion, either from inside the building in our climates or in southern climates from outside the building moving in, is not the big culprit typically. So we're not going to fuss too much about that. Uh, we touched on the liquid applied uh, secondary barriers. They're good, but you're not going to see them very much. Well, you're not going to see them at all unless you're watching a building being built, but you're just not going to find those very often. Foam insulation uh, can also make an, a very good secondary barrier. Again, if it's installed perfectly and if nobody messes with it after. Some of the, uh, the foam insulations have been subject to some pretty significant shrinkage problems. And uh, I don't know if any of you have taken apart a wall or a ceiling that was insulated with urea formaldehyde foam insulation. Uh, UFI was very sensitive. It was a two-part foam mixed on site. And it was not very hard to get the mix slightly wrong. And I've seen UFI, and, and I'm not talking about the, the trumped up health issues around it. I'm talking about the performance of it as an insulation and an air barrier. And I've seen it where it started out filling the two by four cavity. And after a few years, it's occupying less than 50% of that cavity. It just shrunk like crazy if it wasn't uh, mixed and installed properly. So it was um, throwing good money after bad sometimes to take an uninsulated wood frame wall, for example, fill it with uh, urea formaldehyde foam insulation and think you'd done something wonderful, but often didn't really help at all. Okay. Um, the next things we're going to look at are the rain screens. And uh, rain screens started to get a lot of attention when we started to have all the uh, synthetic stucco problems, the leaky condos and so on. And people said, okay, wait a minute. Keeping the rain out is not working. What are we going to do? The second barrier helps, but that didn't quite do it either. So what they started to do was say, you know what? Let's let it get past the first layer and then let's drain it out so that we don't have to rely on that second barrier to be absolutely perfect as well. So the thinking was two rain barriers with a bit of space between the two. And then the vented rain screen we'll look at a little bit at the end. And that actually added the feature of not only having a space in there, but the space would be vented. So instead of just weep holes at the bottom, there would often be uh, gaps at the top as well to allow uh, the air to move up through. And you'd get uh, some nice convective loops that would really help dry the, uh, the wall assembly. Um, and there's, there's a couple of other uh, advantages to the, the rain screen that uh, we'll look at here. So most of you will be familiar with uh, a wood frame wall with masonry veneer, not so much out west, but uh, in a lot of the country. And it's a very typical rain screen. A lot of people, and, and certainly a lot of your clients, will not understand that brick walls subjected to a wind-driven rain will have the water pass right through. They're, they're porous and permeable. And all those joints between brick and mortar are they're just not perfect. So you're going to get moisture that gets through. And if the brick wall is built properly, there's about a one inch airspace between the brick and whatever sheathing paper is on the outside of the exterior sheathing. Now, does the mortar ever get laid in a sloppy way so that the mortar is in behind the brick and obstructs those uh, air spaces? Oh, you bet. 
Is the mortar ever laid in a sloppy way where the mortar falls down and fills the cavity at the bottom where the weep holes are so they don't work? Oh, absolutely. So this is a nice looking illustration, but it's not particularly real world. So again, we don't get to see whether that cavity behind is open and accessible. You hope that it is. And by the way, if you look down at the very bottom, there is supposed to be a flashing that extends up the exterior of the foundation wall behind the brick and behind the sheathing paper and then comes down underneath the brick and out through the wall. Does that always get installed? No. Does it always get installed properly? Absolutely not. So very often, and certainly uh, in our market, we see a lot of uh, weep holes with no evidence of flashing whatsoever. So any, uh, think about a hairline crack in this uh, poured concrete foundation. Cracks usually occur at stress concentration points like this 90 degree turn. And if there is no flashing, that water comes down, collects, and then leaks through the foundation into the basement or crawl space. Very common issue that's pretty tough to detect the source of without thinking in this kind of cross-sectional way. Okay, so the rain screens are designed to help. Wait a minute. I left out one important point on rain screens. I should have touched on the pressure. Remember I said very often when it rains, the wind is driving the rain. So here we have driving rain, and so we've got the wind pressure pushing on the outside of the brick wall. One of the great things about a rain screen wall is that those weep holes will allow the wind to drive in, and it will actually pressurize that cavity behind the brick. And that's a good thing, because if we slightly pressurize that cavity, that means there's not as big a pressure differential from the front of the brick to the back. And if I don't have as much pressure differential, I don't have as much water going through. So if you think about filling that space up like a balloon and having all kinds of air pressure pushing back from the inside, from the back of the brick, that'll stop the water from going through. So it's one of those pleasant consequences of a good series of weep holes and vented wall systems that in the driving wind, you pressurize the back of the cavity, or the cavity behind the siding, if you will, and that mitigates the rain moving through. So a much better situation than not having that uh, rain screen. Okay, so a vented rain screen, we talked about having the additional opportunity to uh, get the air in behind. It helps to mitigate that pressure differential, and it also helps dry more quickly. So what we hope happens is the cladding stops most of the water, the secondary barrier stops the rest, the gaps talk about uh, reducing that pressure differential and reduce the amount of water moving through the cladding. Um, and the gap that forms in the rain screen has to be enough so that it provides a capillary break. If the gap is less than a quarter inch, 3 16ths or less, for example, that'll actually wick water away from the back of the cladding into the system, so we don't want that. And then at the bottom, we want drainage to let the water out, and in a perfect world, if it's vented, uh, we have the convection air moving in at the bottom, coming out at the top, that helps dry out the wall quickly before we can get into the rot scenario. So, Modern stucco, especially after all the problems, generally uh, built with vented rain screen principles, uh, so that has the air gap, the vented drainage plane, and there's lots of drainage plane materials. We'll look at those in a minute. You want a capillary gap. Typically, they've given up on house wraps. Well, it depends where you are and, and who the builder is. Um, and the integrated drainage materials are, uh, are now a popular component of that. So we've looked at four systems quickly and simplistically. We've rated them from worst to best. I'm going to add a fifth type in here, and I'm going to call it the mass wall. And the mass wall says, I'm going to be big and I'm going to be porous, 
but I'm going to be uh, like a catch and release kind of guy. I'm going to allow the water to get into the wall assembly, and then I'm going to dry it to the outside after. And so what the heck do I mean by that? Well, here's a couple of examples of what I call mass walls. So a log house, for example, would be a solid timber wall. The w wood in a driving rain will absorb some moisture, get wet, hold it, and then dry back out to the outside. A solid masonry wall, and you can tell this is a solid masonry wall by the header bricks, so I've got two courses of masonry here. I've got no wood framing. I've got plaster on the inside, probably on wood lath. And that wall doesn't get wet to the inside of the building, even in the driving rain. And the reason is that masonry has enough capacity to hold the moisture, and then when the rain stops, the sun comes out, it dries to the outside rather than the inside. And obviously, we've been building like this for a very long time, and mass walls do work. Very different strategy than wood frame construction, but wanted to make sure we touched on that. Okay, let's move on and talk for a little bit about what happens when we don't manage to keep the rain out, which, as I said, you're probably not going to do anyway. Um, we do hope we can drain the water out. That's the biggest thing. We want the drying potential. Less important than good drainage, but still pretty helpful. So if you think of it as a race, if the wall gets wet and stays wet, you lose and you get rot and mold. And if it gets wet but dries out pretty quickly, you can win the game. So getting wet fast, not able to dry is a problem. Staying wet is a problem. Um, key things. We want that drain vented cavity is great, which helps do all these things I've listed here that we've touched on. Uh, we talked about drainage mats. This would be typical behind a synthetic stucco, for example, or any place we want to make sure that we are allowing water that gets past the cladding system to find an easy way out. And uh, these actually leverage capillary action to help get rid of the water and stop it from migrating through to the inner wall assembly, which I'm going to say for sake of argument is uh, wood frame. OK, we talked about walls being open at the bottom. Um, the term drip screed or weep screed to me mean the same thing. And here's a cross section of one, this little triangular piece of metal at the bottom and a flashing that goes up the wall surface covered by your secondary barrier. And the vented rain screen perhaps filled with the drainage mat material in behind. You can see the water droplets running down the back. And at the bottom, you want to have a drip screed or a weep screed to allow that water to escape and to protect the bottom of the finished wall assembly. So it kind of works like that. There's another illustration showing it. And the uh, somewhat triangular shaped uh, profile is common. There are other profiles that people use as well. But you can see the, uh, the idea here. Notice that we want this to be about eight inches above grade. So stucco, and especially synthetic stucco that comes down close to grade, is generally speaking a recipe for disaster. And we see a lot of stucco without any visible uh, drip screed at the bottom. So I'm going to tell you, when you look at a stucco wall, if you don't do anything else, look at the bottom of the wall. And in a perfect world, it's fun to try and get your fingers up in behind. And if you can find um, gaps or openings there, then you've got a better built wall that has more chance of being successful. Here's another example where we've got a different profile. Uh, you can see the uh, backer rod and the sealant here, but these are not continuous. Where you're looking, it looks like how the heck would the water get out? The reality is those have gaps in them, kind of like weep holes do in uh, brick mortar joints. So these are not continuous. These are intermittent so that the uh, water coming down can get out. So that is a different type of assembly to accomplish the same thing. Again, protect the bottom of the uh, cladding material and allow the water that gets through and accumulates in the drainage plane to escape without damaging the wall assembly. 
So how do you create a drainage plane? In this case, we've put the house wrap on and uh, some idiot put it on upside down. I don't know how that works from an advertising standpoint for DuPont, but uh, there you go. Um, and they've used uh, wood strapping to uh, build out and create that drainage plane. And somewhat sensibly, the strapping is installed vertically. You can imagine horizontal strapping is not going to drain very well. And you think I'm being facetious, but I'm not. Because if you're putting up a building with, let's say, board and batten siding or vertical channel siding, the tendency is you want to put the strapping on horizontally, right? So you can nail the vertical boards onto something every couple of feet going up the wall. But that defeats the, uh, the whole drainage plane system. So if you're putting on horizontal siding, this works just fine. If you're going to put on vertical siding, you might put this on and then put a horizontal strapping over it so you can put the vertical siding on and have something to nail it to. Again, I'm showing you this and we're talking about it. In reality, you're not going to know. You're just not going to be able to see how the wall was built. Okay, we've touched on drawing potential a little bit. Um, and it's pretty simple. So once the wall gets wet, and it's probably going to, can it dry out? Ventilation sure helps. Um, a lot of people are saying that a 3 8 gap for a vented rain screen is adequate. I'm a bigger is better kind of guy. I'd like to see at least 3 quarters of an inch. I want to give it a chance to dry out, especially since I know if you shoot for 3 8 of an inch, in some places you're not going to get it and maybe not get anything. So believe it or not, I like porous sidings because they breathe and the moisture gets in, but it can also get back out. And it's one of the real problems with synthetic stucco. It is that absolute plastic bag on the outside. And when water gets behind synthetic stucco, there's almost no chance it's drying to the outside. It can't get back out through the stucco. So all the little gaps and so on in the driving rain allow the water in, pull it in through capillary action, gravity, whatever, drives it straight through, and then it can't get out. And that's what causes so much damage to uh, the uh, wall assemblies when we have that kind of a system. So a face seal system traps the water, and we get the rot. Um, drying potential is pretty great in dry climates. Of course, when the air is natively dry and it's windy, that promotes drying. Coastal areas a little bit tougher. So here we are in beautiful Vancouver. Here is a pretty nasty fog that is going to be pretty tough for anything to dry. And if this kind of weather persists, and I think uh, a lot of folks would say in coastal climates, the relative humidity is typically high, especially, uh, well, I'm going to say temperate uh, coastal climates, like we have lots of in Canada. This creates a pretty vulnerable situation. It makes building tricky. And uh, this is why we have some of the biggest problems where we do. OK, let's spend a little bit of time talking about what to look for and what we can watch out for as building inspectors. I'm going to say, as I've said before, we don't get to take the walls apart and see what's going on behind. So I'm going to encourage you to look for vulnerable buildings, look for vulnerable areas on the buildings, and do a little bit of deductive reasoning beyond that. So talked about climate. Let's talk about microclimates. So I'm going to worry more about a cottage than a house. I'm going to worry about something that's on the water, not because of the water particularly, but because it's exposed to wind. Houses high on a hill, great vantage point, beautiful views, but they're inherently more vulnerable to wall problems caused by moisture as a result of being exposed to high winds. Even big fancy houses with large lawns, a sloping lawn coming up toward the house, you can just see the wind being directed against that lawn and being pushed up and uh, slamming into the house. Open fields, uh, all that kind of stuff, inherently more vulnerable. I'm going to tell you that uh, flat roofs are a problem. Slope grooves actually shed the water rather than form a watertight skin. but Otherwise, sloped roofs also help deflect the wind. 
and a low building with a steep slope roof will have less wetting of the walls than a lower slope, taller building. So overhangs are great. They protect the walls. Obviously, if we can uh, put something like an umbrella sticking out over the wall, it's not going to get as wet. Here's an interesting little table from the uh, National Research Council. So they're saying, does a roof overhang actually affect wall performance? And so this chart works like this. So if there's no overhang, they found problems in over 90% of the walls. If the overhang's up to a foot or 300 millimeters, 70%. If the overhang's one to two feet, 300 to 600 millimeters, you're about just under 60% of the walls had a problem. And if you get that uh, overhang out to be more than two feet, the number drops down to 30%. So overhang matters for sure. So there's a pretty cool overhang. That wall is pretty well protected. Those of you with architectural sensibilities may uh, have some comments on the structure, but the overhang's great and uh, that absolutely protects those walls. So big overhangs make a significant difference to the performance of a wall, and you can be a whole lot sloppier about how you build the wall with that kind of protection. So worst combination, flat roof, no overhang. Significantly vulnerable wall. Here we go. This kind of architecture uh, probably works great in Arizona and New Mexico probably tricky in coastal areas in particular, but right across Canada. So there we go. Um, taller the building, the worse it is. Again, if you stick something up into the wind, it's just going to catch more of it. And by the way, winds are more significant the higher up you go away from the ground. So uh, those of you who have spent time in high-rise buildings or out on rooftop balconies in high-rise buildings generally know that you get more wind and stronger wind the higher up you go. So everybody should live in a bungalow, right? Well, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, interestingly, uh, in some uh, building code jurisdictions, the walls need to be dif built differently if they're more than two stories for exactly that reason. Um, what part of the wall gets the wettest? We talked about you have to know what direction your wind-driven rain comes from. The bottom of the wall sees more water than the top, somewhat logically, because whatever hits the top runs down by gravity. Area below windows sees more water than any other part of the wall. We talked about that a little bit. And then parapet walls are in dire straits right out of the gate because they get wet from both sides. Okay, so... When you're looking at walls, you're looking at those kind of local climate things. You're looking at the orientation, type of wall. Uh, are you going to be able to tell? Not always, but is it a face seal wall? Is it a rain screen? Is it a vented rain screen? Um, look for drainage at the bottom of the wall. That is going to be inconclusive. But all of this stuff is. So we're looking at assembling clues here. This is a little bit of deductive reasoning. So uh, we've talked about this. Horizontal projections are a problem. Again, uh, below them, the window sills and so on, we talked about the capillary breaks and so on. Uh, and joints and penetrations is a fairly obvious one. What are we looking for? Some of the visible clues are going to be damaged areas, previous repairs, evidence of testing. We'll get a, a look at some of those uh, in a minute. Uh, all walls leak, uh, we have to absolutely concede that. Damage is very often going to be not visible and concealed, so you may say everything looks fine, people move in, rip out a wall to do some remodeling and end up with a mess. Um, that's where it gets ugly. So let's have a look at some pictures here. So what do we think about this building when we think about building science and uh, design? So it's a tall home, multi-story, flat roof, no overhang. We've got no rain screen, and the building has no chance of staying dry. It's about as simple as that. Almost no matter what wall assembly you build, they're going to leak. All walls leak, little tiny gaps, and some are visible, some are not. If you poke and look and think about it closely enough, you can always find the openings. 
So this wall doesn't look particularly bad from the outside, but here we are with the moisture meter showing a 53.6% moisture content in that wall assembly. That's not healthy for the wood. Here's a wall that made its own drainage plane. So the wall is leaking out the bottom, and that's water that has gotten through the siding, accumulates trap, and some of it's coming out the bottom, but quite frankly, a ton of it is staying in that wall. Inside, uh, most of you have experience doing this. Um, I'm not going to tell you that you should be lifting carpets. I am going to tell you that you often see some uh, clues that are not otherwise visible if you do. Here we are at the bottom corner of a window. This one's glass block, but this just doesn't work. This is poor, incomplete workmanship. That's going to be a problem. Well. No, it's not going to be a problem. It already is. So cut away the stucco, the wall's a mess behind. So this is a window sill. So we've got the window at the top right part. We've got the sill, and then we've got the wall below down at the uh, bottom left part of the picture. So first of all, synthetic stucco is not inherently designed to be installed as a horizontal surface. Secondly, when you don't even install it correctly and you don't cover the mesh, what are your odds of success? I'm going to say slim to none. When you look at a building like this, you should have a yellow flag going up right away. That stucco wasn't put on with that architectural feature of being different colors all over the place. You can't see from this photo, but the number of hairline cracks are crazy. Um, there's a parapet wall up uh, at the top there. Uh, this wall was a mess. Here we have a flashing at the bottom of a stucco wall at a wood band. And the flashing is actually sloped back into instead of down and away from the wall assembly. And you can see what's happened to the wood below. We talked about parapet walls. Um, it's just ugly. We've got a cap flashing here, but this wall's not in great shape. Where railings join walls, previous repairs, always a good clue. If this has been a problem once. Is it likely to be an ongoing problem? Absolutely. Um, rain screen wall, vents above windows. You should be able, if you reach up here, to feel the screen, and you might feel the strapping in behind as well. So this is above a window. There's the, the drainage below the window. Okay. If you don't want to build a rain screen wall, you can kind of do this. You have an option. That, that's probably effective. Not great looking, but hey, does the job. Um, stuccoing over the gutter is probably not terrific building practice. Uh, the absence of a kick out flashing doesn't help. Um, Again, concealed water damage, you should have a very strong yellow flag coming up here. All these horizontal ledges, why do we want to capture the water and hold it close to the building? This is just so wrong. It's just inviting disaster. So I don't like horizontal projections on walls. Um, architecturally, Tudor siding is terrific. Functionally, Tudor siding is stupid. And if you're looking at a building with Tudor siding, think like the water, think, look at all those Vs, look at the top of all the horizontal joints, and you usually find problems. Again, from six feet away, you may not see anything. You got to look closely. And again, most of the damage is often concealed. Okay, here's again a really coming back into a wall. The saddle has uh, been cocked a bunch of times. Uh, this is, again, just ugly. So as they say, the devil's in the details, and the details on exterior walls just kill you. Now, this one's a little easier to see. We talked about the bottom parts of windows uh, being wet. Flush-mounted window, no sill, projecting out. Uh, this is not a happy wall. Stucco relieves stress by cracking, and we talked about uh, wood frame with stucco on the outside. Um, there are no uh, control joints in this wall. We talked about the wood frame expanding and contracting 
way more than the stucco wants to expand and contract, so it just gets torn apart. We've got some prior repairs, and whenever you see this, when the stucco is two distinctively different textures, again, you should be thinking, somebody's had to do a significant repair here. The new wall might be okay. What's going on with the old section that hasn't been redone yet? Lots of things to think about here. And you look at all the, the penetrations here. You look down at the bottom, at the bottom of the railing. You look where the railing ties into the wall. You've got the door opening. You've got the light fixture, windows over here. What are the chances those joints are all 100% tight? And even if they are for a while, what are the chances it's going to stay 100% tight? Pretty remote. Under the corners of windows, openings, doors, you can see here, this has been patched, and now it's been caulked. Uh, is there something ugly going on behind here? Absolutely possible. Interestingly, this water is not being drawn up. This water is in the wall above, and it's coming down through the, through the inside of the wall, and it's fighting its way out through the top of this window. So this is absolutely no drainage plane. The water has found its way in through various imperfections in the wall above and now it's coming out at the bottom. So when you see this, you should be saying, yeah, that wall assembly is probably in distress. Usually you don't get to see the damage until things are opened up, and it's usually way more significant than what you thought it was going to be. Okay, I'm coming up to the end here. We're a little bit uh, after nine. I apologize for running a little bit late, but uh, let me get to a good stopping point here. We'll throw it open to questions and let you folks get on with your, uh, your evening. Um, again, in this picture, we've got water running out from behind the caulking down there. And can you see where I've said, what's this? Can you see the capillary break in the wall here? So this is supposed to keep the water that's running down that wall surface from running back along that horizontal edge and getting into the window assembly. So this the staining you're seeing here is not from water running from the surface of the wall and along the underside. This has actually gotten into the wall up above and is now trying to come out. This is pretty typical when you look closely at buildings. You got the joint that might have been intact originally, but as walls move, materials shrink and expand. The cracks open up. Caulking's no good if it's missing, and it's also no good if it's dried out. Penetrations like this, again, almost never sealed well. And if they're sealed well on original construction, the joints are hardly ever maintained properly. Here we've got more evidence of improperly applied stucco. This mesh is not supposed to be exposed. That's part of the base coat. What do you see here? You see a little bit of damage. The mesh is exposed. Is this eight inches above grade level? Heck no. Is there a drip screed or a weep screed at the bottom of this stucco wall? Heck no. You can see the mesh hanging down. This is just poor practice and sadly very common. We talked about kickout flashings. I think most of you are probably familiar with kickout flashings and how the absence of a kickout flashing allows all the water running down here to go right in behind the stucco right there. So we've got to have a good kick-out flashing that diverts. And if you think about the water landing on the roof and you think about wind driving the rain from right to left in this photo, that water's going to hit the roof and then it's going to be pushed against the wall and it's going to run down where that black line is. And if we don't stop it from going behind the stucco wall surface, we're going to have a heck of a mess. This is a brand new building with exactly the scenario we talked about. There's no kick-out flashing here. And you can't see it real well, but the stucco is already starting to, uh, to bubble and deform at the bottom here. So, I mean, they haven't even got the uh, stickers off the uh, new windows yet. Brand new construction. This is probably a matter of uh, weeks rather than months. And look what we're getting. So here are some other clues to look for. Um, what do those two holes tell you? Somebody has used a probe to be looking for moisture in the wall. 
what does this circular vent tell you? Somebody's cut a core test in here. So that's what somebody's done. This little uh, vented plug is put back in after. But somebody was looking for troubles here. Somebody had a reason to do this. This is board and batten siding. Look how close it is to ground level. Um, doesn't look bad here, but this is going to be part of a bigger story. So when you see this kind of stuff, you might well worry about that. And unfortunately, I said the area below windows tend to be the wettest part. They also tend to be the parts that commonly have cracks as a result of uh, concentrated stresses. So you get a double whammy here, of course. You get the water concentrating and the cracking. Can you see the probe holes here? Again, somebody quite sensibly was looking below the corner of this window for evidence of uh, wall damage in behind. Diagonal crack here, it's been patched in kind of a half-baked way. More of the same. Three cut tests, all strategically located. People don't do this on good walls. People are trying to solve a problem and figure out what's going on. It's an interesting picture. This is a 30-year-old house. It had uh, tongue and groove cedar siding. It had a single layer of building paper on it. Um, and it just got shredded. The, uh, the moisture got in. The uh, siding's a mess. Building paper see the rot to the wood sheathing, plank sheathing. And interestingly, focused below windows and openings. And interestingly too, when the water comes down through these wall assemblies and hits that bottom plate, it often doesn't have any place to go. So the rot and the damage to wood frame walls behind cladding, the damage is often concentrated at sill plates because that's where the water stops and gets hung up makes perfect sense, but that's just a really good visual example of it. Vinyl cladding shouldn't leak, right? Well, again, if the cladding's perfect, but look at the number of joints here. What are the chances? Well, I'm going to tell you the chances uh, were not very good. Here's what happens. Here's uh, this OSB that once it gets wet, it just tends to swell and rot and doesn't dry. The more complicated I make things, the worse they are. Look at the number of uh, changes in direction, changes in materials here. This should be making you think, what the heck is going on? What happens when the rain hits all this stuff? Whoops, sorry about that. Again, these joints, and again, when the camera is 16 inches away, it's pretty obvious, but this is real easy to walk by. You've got to be thinking about these joints as you're doing an inspection, and you've got to be paying attention to the small stuff. People say don't sweat the small stuff. Unfortunately, in our world, we have to sweat the small stuff. The caulking around the outside of the bottom of this post, definitely not confidence-inspiring. Okay, so what do we say in reports? Let me just touch on that real quick before we close off. You need to be able to address vulnerable situations, and whether you see a problem or not, you should point it out as an area to be aware of. Um, where you're suspicious, uh, a recommendation that says something like, walls of this type, prone to concealed damage, further evaluation by a specialist. Something like that. I don't care what words you use, but you've got to protect yourself by saying, all the conditions are right for something to be going on in this wall. Don't know what it is. Okay, so by way of summary, all the stuff we've talked about. Water's the enemy, all walls leak, the climate matters, the wall construction type matters, the building shape, size, and orientation all matter, and it can be costly, and it's usually hard to see. So a bit daunting, a lot of information dumped at you real quick. I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Brian and say thank you. Uh, and hopefully I did not put you to sleep. I'm sure you didn't put anyone to sleep, but we really do appreciate the quite the insight uh, there, Alan. A lot of information for everyone to digest. We had uh, plenty of questions come on through. Uh, now, I know that uh, because we're running a little bit late, I'm going to do my best to address uh, some of the questions. I see some people have left that have asked questions, so I'm going to uh, favor the people that are still in the audience and address those questions first. Now, starting sort of from top down, 
uh, one of our viewers by the name of uh, Sergey, and I apologize if my pronunciation is bad, please uh, forgive me there, uh, asked uh, with regard to one of the photos earlier on when you had the, you showed the, the hail damage, he asked uh, about the vinyl siding, showed that there's no siding on the ground, and he asked, was it because of the emergency team? So this would be one of the first photos that you had shown in Texas with the hail damage? Absolutely. Short answer is I don't know where the siding uh, went to, whether it had been cleaned up, whether it was emergency team. Um, I wondered that myself. But uh, the photo was given to me by somebody else. As I said, that event was in 2008. There we go. And yeah, I'm not sure whether there's something on the ground there. There might be something white, but uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Perfect. No, appreciate that. Next question we have here is with regard to... Uh, George asked, how narrow a crack will pull water in? Can a crack be too tight to pull water in? Um, if you can see it, it'll pull water in. So, like less than your thumbnail? Uh, absolutely. So, yeah, there, I mean, when you think about uh, that celery stalk that I showed, I mean, the, the celery looks pretty solid and yet the pores are, uh, are small. So cracks will let water in. Porous materials like wood and masonry will also let water come in, not necessarily through a crack, but moving through the pores in the material itself. So there's almost no crack too small. And again, depending on the material, if you're between two pieces of metal, that would be true. But yeah, a paper thin crack will draw water in quite happily. Excellent. And next question comes from one of our viewers by the name of Diana, and she asks, with regard to wood strapping, would it not absorb the water instead of drain? This is when we're talking further about drainage. Absolutely. It's a great question. So the wood will absorb the water, and this is where drying potential becomes important. So when you think about uh, wood shingles as a siding or wood clapboard, doesn't it get wet and absorb water? Sure it does. Um, but and you think wood fences too, cedar fences, do they get wet and absorb water? Sure they do. But the magic is, can they dry? And getting wood doesn't suffer if it gets uh, wet as long as it can dry before the, the mold organisms can start to grow. So yes, you're absolutely right. The, the strapping's going to get wet in behind. Um, but wood is just so ubiquitous here, and if you do it right, horizontal strapping that catches water and the water sits on top is likely to rot because it's going to have a tougher time drying. That vertical strapping we saw over the Tyvek, that's going to dry pretty quickly, all things being equal. And again, at the bottom of the strapping, I didn't show you this, but at the bottom of the strapping, you cut the strapping about two inches short, so the foot of the strapping is not sitting on a horizontal surface because then that will tend to rot. So I'm a big believer and I won't get into all the design stuff about cutting angles and curves and so on, but the end grain of wood is just like a ridiculous sponge. We don't want water accumulating, accumulating at the end grain. So uh, we try to keep the bottom of strapping up above any horizontal surface. Thank you for the answer there, Alan. And I actually have a follow-up question by Dana. This is with regard to walls and testing or probing for water. Is there a way that you can utilize that in a non-invasive or non-penetration type of manner? For sure. There are uh, Tramax moisture meters that are non-penetrating. And uh, uh, a lot of my colleagues who do stucco investigations uh, will use a non-penetrating uh, moisture meter. It's not something that, that we do, but uh, that's absolutely a technology that can be leveraged. Would thermal imaging help in that regard as well, by chance, or no? Uh, a definite maybe on that one. Uh, thermal imaging to identify moisture problems in walls. Uh, remember that thermal imaging is measuring uh, temperature differential. So it is not looking for water, and if the wall surfaces are similar temperatures inside and out, the wall can be soaking wet and you may not see any evidence of it with an infrared camera. So uh, you need what's called a delta T or a temperature differential across the wall 
to pick up the anomalies in a lot of cases. So I would say that an infrared camera might be helpful, but it might also be quite misleading and you're more likely to get uh, false positives than false negatives. I'm going to say I'd leave that to the expert thermographer and the conditions have to be right, which is why it doesn't make much sense in a home inspection to be trying to do that because you're out there in a given time frame. You don't get to pick your spots and control the temperature conditions. So I'm going to say, and, and the good thing about me is I'm one person with one opinion. Somebody else is going to have a different opinion. You're welcome to it. But in my opinion, that's a low percentage game to play. Thank you kindly for the answer there, Alan. And we got another question here by a gentleman by the name of Mark. Um, <clears throat> so let me read this clearly. It seems that using good drainage details and doing a fine job of keeping water out of a wall assembly cannot always compensate for the many opportunities, mainly at horizontal details, for water to accumulate behind cladding. Would you agree with that statement? Or 100 percent. Yeah that I, we kind of said a couple of times that no matter how good a job you do, something's going to fail, something's going to be imperfect, uh, caulking joints are going to dry out, building materials that were put in perfectly are going to shrink, uh, twist, warp, expand, change dimensionally, and uh, no matter what you do, I think you have to design the wall with the anticipation that water is going to get past your cladding and then how do we get it out, how quickly can we get it out, and how well can we dry the assembly behind should be considerations no matter what you do. As a uh, follow-up to that exact statement also by Mark, he, he mentions, so it seems counterintuitive that so many engineered woods like SmartSide and other water-sensitive materials like fiber cement are used. How would you perhaps uh, reply to that? Well, it's a great question. I don't know that I have a terrific answer. There are a lot of uh, engineered uh, materials. Uh, the inner seal, Louisiana Pacific, is obviously uh, the subject of lots of class action lawsuits. Um, so there are lots of those materials that have not performed very well for some of the reasons we've talked about. Um, some of the fiber cement boards have had their issues as well. Uh, I'm not an expert on uh, all of the issues and all the class action lawsuits around those. Um, but the point's very well taken and, and this, uh, I mean I'm the principal in an engineering company but engineers sometimes outsmart themselves by coming up with clever solutions and I think people spend a lot of time thinking about the cosmetics and thinking about the, what I'm going to call the superficial problems, like fiber cement board is great for impact resistance and so on. It's often fairly low maintenance in terms of painting and so on, but it's had its own issues. And uh, most building materials have some weaknesses, uh, pros and cons, strengths, weaknesses, and you really need to understand them. And the, the part that I see time and time again is the new wonder materials, the Tyvek that was uh, going to be the answer to all things turned out not to be. But it takes 10 or 20 years sometimes for the uh, the problems to arise. So I'm, I must admit I'm a bit old school and uh, when people have been building it that way for 300 years and it works, I'm a big fan of uh, round siding nails. So uh, yeah, I'm. it is counterintuitive but we do it. Uh, Everybody's driven by making a business difference, making money, selling product, and uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Much appreciated there, Alan. And we have a <clears throat> excuse me. We have another question by the gentleman by the name of Harry. And he's asking, with regard, you were talking about surfacants and may deteriorate. Were you talking about house paper or was it house wrap? Uh, more house wrap. That's so right. that would be the. Yeah, the spun polyolefin products and so on that uh, have an inherent water uh, repellent, if you will, nature on the surface. But when they're exposed to oils and soaps, that water repellent surface gets lost. And uh, that is what allows the deterioration to take place. 
Perfect. And we have a gentleman by the name of Jim asking a question or making a statement. With regard, this is probably a reference to one of the photos later in the uh, presentation. It said, uh, with regard to the rock dash stucco, seeing there was no drainage at the bottom, the, the stucco itself was successful, but the, the drainage seemed to pour at the bottom. Yep. There are lots of cases where people get away with bad construction details, and I'm sure you guys have all seen it. Um, doesn't make it right, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think I had a, maybe a few pictures in here of uh, stucco coming down to the wall. Um, there's one there. Like, that's a pretty small section. You can't tell uh, whether there's uh, some distress there. The reality is the distress is rarely going to be on the stucco surface itself unless you're below a window and things have come out through the front. But the damage can be going on in behind that. So yeah, that this to me is a uh, is a write up situation. So the damage to the stucco surface, the too close to grade, and the lack of a uh, drip screed or weep screed, I would uh, write all of those up as potential issues. You don't know whether there's a problem going on or not. You, you got to be careful not to overcommit. But I think it's fair to describe those as vulnerable. Thank you kindly for the answer there, Alan. Now I see that we have. Uh, narrow down all of our existing questions so I just want to give the last opportunity for anyone in attendance to ask a question if you're not familiar with how to ask a question there's a question window or even in the chat I'll be glad to pose that to Alan so I'm gonna wait about a minute or so before we complete things if no questions come in for anyone that is leading at this point in time I really do appreciate your attendance we will be sending out in our newsletter the update on when part two will be so hopefully in the coming months we'll have that uh, ready for you. We will also have this recording available on our blog section by next week. So you'll be able to check this out if you want to recap on things. And we're always available for support when you call in. And thank you anyone for the kind wishes. I really do appreciate that. Hope everyone does have a fantastic evening if you're signing off. And great inspections ahead. Well, we've actually, just in case anyone's, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just going to switch over here for a second because Carson Dunlop has recently updated their website. So a lot of individuals have been contacting me with a little bit of a struggle of accessing the homepage because we've made some updates. So I'm just actually going to make myself presenter for a quick second here. And in doing so, I just want to point out something here. So first and foremost, we have a new website, brand new website. Nothing dramatic has changed except for a lot of cool updates visually and some content wise. But as far as Horizon is concerned, when you get to our website now, you can either click Home Inspection Software, or I know many people are often looking for the login button in the top right hand corner. Well, that's been shifted. So you either have to click here or within the More from Carson Dunlop, go to Inspection Software. From there, you'll have the Horizon login button. So if you had this previously bookmarked, perhaps on, you know, obviously on your uh, browser or your desktop, you may want to update that. But in relation to the blog itself, when you come to our new site, you'll be able to go to our resources section. And within the resources section, you'll have access to all of our latest blog entries and more valuable information. You can even see here our late, latest entry about the CSA A770 home inspection standard. So feel free to check out our blog and the URL is carsondunlop.com slash horizon slash resources or again just visit carsondunlop.com and you can access us directly from the home screen. So we have done some updates to our site feel free to check it out but if you are familiar with the previous screen and accessing the horizon login just make sure to get acclimated that initially now when you come to Carson Dunlop you're going to have to access it through the menu, inspection software, Horizon login. Ideally, when you get to this screen, if you haven't already, you should bookmark this. This enables you to automatically access the login screen at any point in time. Now, if anyone's not familiar with how to create a quick access button from their screen, so their desktop, simply let me know in the chat and I'd be glad to follow up with you tomorrow and we can get that set up for you for convenience sake. We will have the PowerPoint presentation as far as what we've shown thus far available, including the audio, all of which will be available. 
My intention is to try to get it available for Monday or Tuesday of next week. We just have to make sure that the individuals handling our website are able to upload it for us. Now I did see a couple questions come through, so in my bit of rambling, I do want to circle back and address these last few questions so everyone can be on their way. And again, thank you for everyone for the well wishes. We greatly do appreciate that. Now with regard, <clears throat> excuse me, so Kevin, and I'm just going to circle back to you, Alan, just because you have your PowerPoint open, so I'm going to make you the presenter again if you just bear with me, please, and thank you. So Kevin had asked a question with regard, the picture of the window that is flush mounted to the stucco with the three black strips of dirt under it. I see this all on new buildings. These are expensive homes. Why are they allowed to keep doing this? Well, in some cases, it may not be a problem if it's a, I'm trying to find, that might be the uh, photo you're thinking of. Um, if it's simply dirt and surface discoloration, that's not the end of the world. Um, so you have to be careful. Uh, sometimes it's unsightly surface staining or discoloration that doesn't have an impact on the wall. But again, it's a yellow flag issue. Yeah, why, why do you see it on new buildings and it ruins the look of a, of a very expensive new home? Absolutely agree. Um, what's the source of the staining and the dirt? Uh, it might be the material, it might be the finishes, it might be stains or paints uh, that haven't uh, cured properly. So there's lots of different uh, things that can contribute to that. Uh, it can be cutting oils off metal flashings and so on. So lots of different things that can cause it. And again, it, it in and of itself doesn't mean there's significant damage behind the wall, but it is, uh, as I say, one of the, uh, the things that I would uh, note and be careful about. I, and dr certainly draw it to the client's attention as a potential weak spot. Fair assumption that you could uh, maybe consider them cheap windows? No. No? Not necessarily. Okay. Now, the, the staining may be coming from the windows, but it may be coming from the material around the windows. It may be coming from the flashing. It may be coming from something uh, inside the wall. So, yeah, you've got to be careful with that assumption. Gotcha. Too many factors at play there. Yeah. Perfect. Well, that was the last question that came in as we were talking there. I don't see anything else coming in. Now, if anyone does have a last-minute question, I'll be sure to pose that. But otherwise, I am going to be wrapping things down. I really do appreciate everyone's attendance. I know we went over somewhat of the allotted time. However, everyone's quite engaged. So as long as everyone's listening, we're certainly glad to keep going. And again, we will send out in our newsletter when we're having part two. So stay tuned. And again, we will also send out an update to everyone that was in attendance as well as who registered about the blog entries so who have access to that. And you can watch at your discretion or leisure. If you have any follow-up questions that you're not able to ask at this time or you think of later, there is a reminder email that sends out after the session. Feel free to reply back to that with any questions you may have. I'll be do a tongue tie there. I'll be certain to try to address them to the best of my ability, or rather, I'll ask Alan to the best address them to the best of his ability. So we will try to get those answers to you. They may be actually responded to in the blog, but we will do our best to address anything that you think of post the session. And in my ramblings, no one asked another question, so I am going to cut things short. And again, thank everyone for their attendance. I really do appreciate you coming through. Alan, you have been quite insightful tonight. I hope that uh, we're able to get this uh, part two going very soon. And everyone, I'm sure, in attendance will be there as well. Thanks, Brian, and thanks for everyone for sticking around. Appreciate it. Cheers, guys. Have a great night. I'm going to be logging off and disabling the webinar at this point in time for everyone.